Good evening, everybody. Again, I'm Dwayne Davison uh, with the Valparaiso International Center. We are very pleased to have you here this evening. Uh, packed crowd, we are so thrilled that everybody is here. Um, you're here for a, a very important event. In Porter County for many years, a few decades, Eva Poor has spoken to eighth graders as a part of their curriculum, and uh, this is her first time speaking to the general public, so you're here on a good night. Um, I want to mention that the Valparaiso International Center is an independent 501c3 nonprofit. If you would like more information on the VIC, we do have a uh, table over here that's got information with a contact list for programs like this uh, that we have. Our biggest signature event of the year is the World Cultural Festival, uh, which is downtown Valparaiso and draws many thousands. Uh, that is in September. Uh, but otherwise, please uh, visit our website, valpovic.org, V-A-L-P-O-V-I-C dot O-R-G. Uh, tonight could not be possible uh, without Valparaiso University. Uh, within that, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences and John Kilpinen uh, has provided financial support for us. In addition, the City of Valparaiso, through the Human Relations Council, we received a community grant uh, for this. Those are our two underwriters for this evening. We very much appreciate that. Uh, other partners that we have are Indiana Dunes Tourism. Uh, we have SALT, which is Social Action Leadership Team, uh, a student group on campus. And uh, finally, the Porter County History Museum, Poco Muse. Uh, in addition, we have the uh, Florence and Lawrence uh, Foundation, the Family Foundation, uh, that is part of the archives that we have over um, at the library. Uh, the Christopher Center is just across the way and houses um, Holocaust archives. So um, as a matter of fact, uh, we do have a member um, of the family here tonight, uh, Danny Spugman. Um, he and his family have the largest collection of Holocaust artifacts in the world. Several of them are here tonight. Um, including a handwritten letter from Joseph Mingla, and uh, he has in his possession a medal that Hitler awarded Joseph Mingla. These are the types of world-class items that uh, Danny Spungman has uh, tonight, so we appreciate his support. Um, the Department of History is our main liaison for this. Uh, Kevin Kostoyevich is here. He'll be uh, having question and answers and moderating that portion. At the end of the session, you will have a chance for that. So uh, Kevin, we very much appreciate the Department of History participating uh, in this. Uh, a little humor for any core students. Um, how many, uh, raise your hand, how many are here? Very good, all in the back. Uh, this is core approved KOR. All right? <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I think only the uh, core students would, uh, would get that, understand that, but um, we uh, have pre-signed DVDs and books, and there will be photo opportunities uh, with Eva um, after. She did have a line earlier and got to as many as she could. Um, she is driving back tonight to Terre Haute, Indiana, which is her home, so she will be here for a while, though, um, selling her pre-signed books and DVDs. So please stay after for that and uh, some photo opportunities. So, um, yeah, uh, tonight is a fantastic night. If you can believe that at uh, the beginning of World War II, as concentra uh, concentration camps were uh, being filled, Joseph Mengele, the angel of death, um, quarantined 3,000 twins, so 1,500 pairs, to do experiments. At the end of World War II, only 200 twins survived, and we have only one of 40, approximately, in the whole world before us tonight. So that gives you some perspective. Um, so longevity, abstinence uh, is the, uh, the narrative here. Um, this core is an amazing bit of history. Who else can say they met somebody who stood face to face with uh, Joseph Mengele? So um, with that, I would like to uh, uh, hold any question or answers until the end of her presentation. You'll have plenty of time for that. 
And uh, please help me welcome Eva Korr. Thank you. Let's get started. Uh, I have a long lecture, and the first thing actually that I will do, I'll ask the people who are standing, thank you for coming. There is a lot of room on the stage. There is room here on the floor, room on the floor there. So those who don't think can stand a long time, I am inviting you to join me on stage and make you a star too. <laughs> I will introduce myself because I like my introduction. <laughs> my name is Eva Kaur. I am a survivor of Auschwitz, a survivor of medical experiments conducted by Dr. Mengele. And now that I am almost 85 years old, I'm trying to survive old age. <laughs> and I found it that it was, it's been a lot more challenging than I saw. My lecture is divided in three parts. Part one, how I survived Auschwitz. Part two, the lessons that I have learned from my unusual life. Part three, questions, answers, pictures, autographs, whatever comes along. I was born in 1934 in a tiny village in Transylvania, Romania. In the village, there were about 100 families, all Christian except my family, the Moses family, was Jewish. In the Moses family, we had six people. My father, Alexander, was 44 in 1944. My mother, Jaffa, was 38. My oldest sister, Edith, 14. My middle sister, Alice, 12 and Miriam and I, twins, were 10 years old. Transylvania is an interesting region in Romania. It's right adjacent to the Hungarian border. World War II started September 1, 1939. By May of 1940, Transylvania was occupied by the Hungarian army. And with the occupation, we became part of Hungary. After the occupation, everything changed. For instance, my father had to go every two weeks to the nearby police station. If he didn't, he was going to be arrested. School started in the fall. We had a one-room schoolhouse that children from age six to age 10 attended. So it was basic school, learning the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. The first book that I received in school was a book about arithmetic, and it said, if you have five Jews and you kill three, how many are left? I know that it's shocking to you, but everything in our life were surrounded with catching and killing Jews. The Hungarians passed two new laws every year, at least two, and they were designed to restrict the lives of Jewish people and make it much more difficult. I'll give you an example. 1942, I was eight years old. The two new laws in 1942 were Jews could not hire anybody but Jewish people. In our village, we were the only Jews, so there was no one to hire. Second law, it was Jews could not travel anywhere without a special permit. As it happened, my mother got sick in the summer of 1942, too sick to handle the responsibilities of a very big, old-fashioned farm. So she needed help. My father asked for a permit to travel to the city. The permit was not granted. And so here I am, eight years old, and I realized that we are in big trouble. I could feel in every ounce of my being that we were in danger. So I said to my father, Daddy, the time has come for us to escape to Romania. The Romanian border was just one hour by foot from our house. 
And the rumor was that life for Jewish people in Romania was much better than in Hungary, and it turned out to be correct. Most of the Jews in Romania survived, while most of the Jews in Hungary were murdered. My father looked at me and said, you are just a little kid. You do not understand the big, important issues in our life. I have a theory that children as young as five years old to 13, they are a lot smarter than people think they are. After 13, the, <laughs> the hormones kick in and everything goes haywire. My father kept saying, we have a nice home, we have plenty of food, and you children even go to school. And then he rationalized and he said, the Germans won't come to this tiny village to pick up six Jews. Well, Daddy, I am eternally sorry that you were 100% wrong and I, the eight-year-old kid, was 100% right. I sure wish it was the other way around. But in March 15, 1944, two gendarmes with guns came to our house, gave us two hours to pack, and they said they were taking us to a regional ghetto throughout Europe. There were ghettos springing up in many occupied countries. These were not ghettos like today in the big cities. These were actual prisons, mostly surrounded by barbed wire fences and sometimes by brick walls. There were big ghettos, like the Warsaw Ghetto was five and half a million people. And there were very small ghettos, like my ghetto, in Shimleo Silvani was only 8,500 Jews. Well, we lived in a rural area. It was difficult to gather all those Jews. Our ghetto had only one building, the commandant's headquarters. So we had to build our tents out of sheets and blankets. But we kept saying, as long as the family is together, somehow we are going to make it. The head of every family, like my father, were taken in for interrogation. Interrogation meant questioning by force. And if you didn't answer the question the, the way they wanted, you got beaten up. So my father was brought back on a stretcher with bleeding whip marks, and all his fingernails and toenails were burned because they kept asking him one question repeatedly, where did you hide all your gold? My father said, I am a farmer. I put all my money in land. They didn't believe him, but it was true. Three days after my father was brought back, we were told to leave all our belongings behind because they are taking us to Hungary to a labor camp that will have everything we needed. We were loaded into cattle cars, about 100 people to each cattle car. One, there was no room to sit, so we were standing and leaning against each other. The, in addition, between each two cattle cars, there was a guard in a booth, a guard with a gun, who told us if anybody tries to escape, he will shoot. The train moved very fast. It only stopped for one reason, to refuel. So I want you to imagine middle of May in a crowded, stinking cattle car. It was unbelievably hot. We had no provisions. And we were very, very thirsty. So when the train would stop, we would ask the guard by our cattle car for water and he always would say, five gold watches. So the grown-ups passed their gold watches through one of the barbed wire windows, and then he would take a bucket of water and throw it in through one of the windows. I put my cup on my head, hoping to catch some of the water coming from above. 
I never got enough than a few drops, maybe to moisten my lips, but not enough to drink. And I wondered at the time, why were we giving them all these gold watches that we were not getting any water? It was the third night in the cattle car. The train stopped, we asked for water, and the answer came back in German. I was 10 years old, and everybody in our cattle car understood what happened. We have crossed the border into Germany. They were not taking us to Hungary to a labor camp. The Hungarian guards have been changed to German. They were taking us to Germany to be murdered. The only thing for us was left to pray. So we began to pray. And we prayed for eight hours when the train stopped again. We again asked for water. There was no answer in any language. The cattle car doors opened. Thousands of people poured out of the cattle car onto a strip of land known as the selection platform because people were selected to live or to die. The selection platform measured 85 feet long by 35 feet wide. In my opinion, there is no strip of land like that anywhere on the face of this earth. There are millions of people were ripped apart from their families forever. As we stepped down, my mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand. She was hoping to hold on to us and hoping by holding on to us she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast and people, the selection platform, people were crowding. There were grandparents, children, mothers, children crying, mothers looking for their children, dogs barking, Nazis yelling order. It was the craziest place I have been to. As I decided to actually turn around to figure out what this place was, and as I turned around, I realized that my father and my two older sisters were not with us. They were gone, never saw them again. Holding on to mother for dear life, a Nazi was running on the selection platform yelling in German, twins, twins. We did not volunteer any information. We didn't even know where we were. He noticed Miriam and me, we were dressed alike, we looked alike. My mother asked, is that good? And the Nazi said yes, and my mother said yes. Then another Nazi came, pulled my mother to the right, we were pulled to the left. And contrary to what you always hear, that people who were pulled to the right went for life and to the left to death. It depended on what track the train arrived. If it arrived on track number one, to the right was death, to the left was life. If it came on track number two, People were facing the center. To the left was death, which was the same direction from track number one, which was the right. I, all I remember, my mother being pulled away, looking back with her arms stretched out in despair. I never even got to say goodbye to her, but I didn't really understand that this would be the last time that I would see her. Miriam and I held on to each other, bewildered. We didn't know what would happen to us. We became part of a group with 12 sets of twins. We were number 13. And one mother, Mrs. Changery, who was my mother's friend, and she had twin daughters, three years younger than we were. Our group was taken away from the selection platform to a big building a processing center. I need to explain to you something. From the day that we arrived in Auschwitz to the day that we were liberated, nobody explained to us anything. So whatever I am telling you, I have experienced, 
I heard rumors or I learned things after the liberation. So we were taken to a processing center. Our clothes were removed immediately and we sat naked for most of the day without knowing what would happen to us. The processing began about 4 or 5 p.m. in the afternoon. We were given a short haircut. Our dresses were returned with a huge oil painted red cross on the back, which I learned years later that meant we were part of medical experiments. Then we were lined up for registration and tattooing. 13 sets of twins, there were 26 children between the ages of two and 16. I was number 25, Miriam was number 26. So I watched 24 little girls being tattooed. I decided that when my turn came, I was not going to cooperate, that I was going to give them as much trouble as a 10-year-old could. So when they grabbed my arm to tattoo it, I began to scream, kick, and carry on. Four people restrained me, two Nazis and two women prisoners. While they heated a long needle over the flame of a lamp, when the needle got hot, they dipped it into ink, and then they burned into my left arm, dot by dot, the capital letter A-7063. With age and all the bruising I get, it doesn't read clearly. Miriam became capital A-7064. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that tattooed its inmates. Why? I do not know. And if you are interested in Auschwitz tattoos, thanks to modern technology, just Google Auschwitz tattoos, you will get quite a sampling. Some of them will be big and bold and very clear. Others worse than mine. So I decided that knowing that the Tattoos resulted from the talents of the tattoo artists, so-called, and from the cooperation or lack of cooperation of the victims. When I compared notes with my twin sister, Miriam, she said that in addition to creating a general confusion, I beat the Nazi holding my arm. I am sure that I was capable of doing that. <laughs> But I don't remember. I was raised to be a nice girl. And as we know, nice girls and boys don't bite. So I must have blocked it out of my mind. Once we were processed, we were marched throughout the camp, and we arrived to our barrack, a wooden a modular horse barn, crude and filthy. The Barrack was divided in two by a brick bench, and then on each side of the brick bench, there was a walkway, and the walkway was three-story high wooden bunk beds. Miriam and I were given a bunk bed on the bottom. It was covered with a thin straw mattress and a filthy bank. So we thought it would be nice finally to stretch out and maybe sleep. But I kept tossing and turning, and I could not sleep. I don't think that human beings can function normally after such a traumatic day. But as I was turning and tossing and turning, I saw something moving on the barrack floor. I began counting them. When I reached five, I jumped up screaming. Mice, very big mice here. A girl from the top bunk bed said, silly kid, these are not mice, these are rats. And you better get used to them because they are everywhere. And as I look around, they were scampering throughout the barrack. So Miriam and I didn't even go back to our bunk bed because our bunk bed was so close to the ground. So we decided to go to the latrine. As we entered the place, there on the filthy latrine floor were the scattered corpses of three children. I have never seen anybody dead before. 
but I realized that in this place children were dying. So I made a silent pledge that I will do anything and everything within my power to make sure that Miriam and I survive and walk out of this camp alive. In the barrack, we were little girls between the ages of two and 16. At night, we would huddle in our filthy bunk beds, crawling with lice and rats. We were starved for food. We were starved for human kindness. We were starved for the love of the mothers and fathers we once had. We had no rights, and somehow we had a fierce determination to live one more day, survive one more experiment. Our days would begin early at 5 a.m. with the shrieking sound of a whistle. By 6 a.m. we were outside for roll call, summer, winter, rain or shine. After roll call, we would get back to the barrack for Dr. Mengele's daily inspection. He would count us. He wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had today. After Mengele would leave, we would get breakfast. Breakfast at Auschwitz, in our case, was a bitter, lukewarm, liquid, cold coffee, zero calories. After breakfast, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would be taken to Auschwitz I, placed naked in a room, about 50 sets of twins, and they would measure just about every part of my body, very detailed measurements. They would spend three hours on one arm, then compare it to my twin sister and compare it to chart. These experiments were not dangerous, but they were unbelievably demeaning. And after the third visit to the observation lab, which I named the observation lab, I would block it out of my mind. On alternate days, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we were taken to another lab that I called the blood lab. They would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections we didn't know then, nor do I know today. The rumor was that they were germs, diseases, and drugs, and that probably was correct. After one of those injections, I became very ill. I was trembling even as the late July or early August sun was burning my skin. My arms and legs were swollen and very painful, and I was covered with red dots. Next visit to the blood lab, instead of tying my arm, they measured my fever, and I knew I was in trouble. I was immediately taken to the hospital. The hospital was an other barrack, but it was filled with people who to me looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He never examined me. He looked at my fever chart, and then he declared, laughing sarcastically. He said, too bad. She's so young. She has only two weeks to live. I knew he was right, but I refused to accept his verdict. I refused to die. So I made a second silent pledge that I will prove Dr. Mengele wrong. I will survive and be reunited with my twin sister, Miriam. For the following two weeks, I have only one clear memory. I remember crawling on the barrack floor because I could no longer walk. And I remember crawling because this barrack was not even allocated water. And I found out that there was a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. It took me forever to get to the other end of the barrack. But as I was crawling, I would often fade in and out of consciousness, and I kept telling myself, even in a semi-conscious state of mind, 
I must survive, I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke and immediately I felt better and stronger. But I still had a fever, so I remained in the barrack for another two weeks, for a total of five weeks in the hospital. Then my fever chart sh showed the normal. Amazingly, I was released and reunited with the other twins and my twin sister, Miriam. Dying in Auschwitz was very easy. Surviving was a full-time job. In order to survive Auschwitz, in my opinion, a person needed two things, a guardian angel and an unbelievable will to live. If you didn't have both, you would die. As I entered the barrack, Miriam was sitting on her bed, staring into space. That was very dangerous. That meant to me that she lost her desire to fight for her life. I asked her, Miriam, what happened to you? What have they done to you? She said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And we didn't talk about Auschwitz until 1985. I tried to understand that, and I came to the conclusion that if children have to fight for their life, they cannot go back to the experience until they feel physically safe and emotionally strong enough to cope with the memories. Miriam and I were liberated on January 27, 1945 by the Soviet Army. We were in refugee camps for another nine months. So we arrived home in Romania in October of 1945 to find no one at home. The house was ransacked and all I found were three crumbled pictures on a bedroom floor. I knew that this was my family and me. I put them in my pocket and never looked at them until 1978. We were taken in by an aunt, my father's younger sister, Aunt Irena, who lived in the big city, and her husband and son were murdered. She married the guy whose family was murdered. So we were that very strange, patched up family. A year or so later, the communists took over Romania and they had wonderful slogans, brotherhood, equality, freedom. I have never heard such big words in my life. Of course I liked it. And I joined the Youth Communist Party. Fast forward to 1948. By 1948, I was 14 years old. I was the president of the Youth Communist Party in my school, and I had under my supervision 30 young pioneers with the red neckties. May Day is a very big holiday in communist countries, so I took my troop to the morning parade. At noon, we had a picnic in the park, and then they told me to take my troop to torch parade at night. I was 14 years old, a survivor of Auschwitz. What could they do to me? I decided that we were parading too much. <laughs> yes, we were. And, and I had tests the next day, so I thought it was more important to study than to go to one more parade. So I sent my troop home. Next day, I was called into headquarters, and they, the director of the youth program started yelling at me, where were you yesterday with your troop? I said, well, I thought it was more important to study than to go to one more parade. He began pounding the table. Then you are in the Communist Party, you are not permitted to think. You are only permitted to follow orders. Is that clear to you? I said, no, if I cannot think, I don't want to be in your party. He began laughing. He said, well, we can kick you out, but there is no school in Romania that you can attend. Well, I didn't know it was that severe a conclusion to it. I remained in the Communist Party 
I shall tell you, I was never a good communist. <laughs> My aunt Irena said, I don't know how, Eva, but you are always in trouble. <laughs> she was right. She said, there is no future for you in Romania. Lucky for us, Israel became a country, and we applied for a visa. Romania still wouldn't let us go for two years. We got our visa in June 1950. We embarked on a ship, and four days later, we arrived in Israel. My aunt also was very smart. They didn't let us take anything except the clothes on our back. But we finally had three matching dresses that my aunt hired a seamstress to sew it for us. So my aunt said, you will wear three dresses and a winter coat. And that is the way we arrived in Israel. Miriam and I were sent to an agricultural school where there were children who survived the war from 30 countries in Europe. In our group, there were 16 year old, old and older. There were about 30 students, a house mother and a house father, and they immediately assigned us a body system. Somebody who taught us a girl was assigned to me and one to Miriam to teach us the ropes. Also, we were immediately accepted in the group. And what I found remarkable was that we were made to work half a day and go to school half a day. So we took care of animals, plants, flowers, assignment in the, in the agricultural school. It was very therapeutic. Most victims in the world are focusing on themselves and their pain and their tragedy. That does not help heal a victim. Focusing on what you can do with your hands, something creative and useful, was very therapeutic. So as I know, in the United States, there are many children who are born to unwanting parents or parents who are on drugs or cannot take care of them. If I had some power in this world, I would like to open at least two agricultural schools in every city. That would immediately give these children a place to stay, enough food, and an education that would change their lives. Because I, as I look at the population of prisoners in prisons, no human being was ever born to become a criminal and become a subject to be imprisoned. Something happened to that individual from childhood to the time that they became criminals. I would like to save those young people, and I think juvenile centers should be closed. They are only training juveniles how to become criminals. I would like to open those schools, but I don't know how to do it yet. So that is my next challenge. <laughs> After two years, we were 18 years old, so we were drafted into the Israeli army. Miriam was sent to medical corps. She studied and became a registered nurse. I was sent to engineering corps. I studied and became a draftsman and was sent to Tel Aviv. I loved it. I remained in the Israeli army eight years, reaching the rank of Sergeant Major. While in Tel Aviv in 1960, I met, did not fall in love, <laughs> but married an American tourist from Terre Haute, Indiana. My husband is also a survivor of the Holocaust. He comes from Riga, Latvia, and he was in Buchenwald for four years. He was liberated by Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff from Terre Haute, Indiana. He, my husband spoke German and Russian, and he learned English very fast and became the interpreter for the Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff. 
and they traveled through Europe for about three or four months until the war ended. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff said to Mickey, Mickey, I am going home to America. My husband said, you Americans are very, very nice people. I would like to go to America too. Will you help me? So he did. So Mickey arrived in Terre Haute, Indiana, March of 1946. He never wanted to live anywhere else. So when I married him in Tel Aviv in 1960, I came from Tel Aviv to Terre Haute. <laughs> it's like landing on the moon. <laughs> the only thing these two cities had in common, they both started with the letter T. <laughs> Miriam got married in 1958. She married an Israeli and she expected her first baby in 1960. She developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. The second pregnancy in 1963 got much worse, and the Israeli doctors studied her, and they found out that Miriam's kidneys did not grow larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. Since we don't have the files from the experiments, all I can do is speculate that when I didn't die in the experiment that Dr. Mengele was doing, that he decided to use Miriam in another experiment. He was very interested in kidney functions because he suffered from severe kidney infections when he was a teenager. That is the reason, as Miriam told me, she was injected with probably a hundred injections. I beg Miriam, please don't have any more children. You have two children, that's pretty good. But Miriam didn't listen to me, and 11 years later, in 1974, she had another child, barely survived the pregnancy, and after the baby was born, Miriam's kidneys started to deteriorate and the doctors could not do anything. By 1987, her kidneys failed, at which time she had two choices, to go on dialysis or have a kidney transplant. Well, she opted for a kidney transplant. I had a simple choice. I had two kidneys and one sister. I donated my left kidney November 16, 1987. So it's been 31 years ago. We were a perfect match. But a year after the transplant, Miriam developed cancerous polyps in the bladder. At that hospital, they have been doing transplants for 10 years, and they had 2,000 survivors. All of them were average Israeli citizens. None of them were survivors of Mengele's experiments. So the doctors realized that Miriam's problem was from the experiments. Something from the experiments was left in her body that combined with the anti-rejection medication to create the cancer. They kept pressuring me to try to find our files I have done everything within my power. I even had the audacity or stupidity to protest in the Capitol Rotunda at a memorial service to the Holocaust in 1986. They arrested me, brutally roughed me up, and tore my right rotator cuff. So I cannot raise my hand higher than that one. I can raise that. Uh, but even with all my effort, we had never found out what was injected into our bodies. Miriam's cancer metastasized, and she died June 6, 1993. I will take you back to the camp for an observation. As I told you, children under age 13 are very smart. 
but they also function completely differently than teenagers and grown-ups. It takes a lot of mental energy for a young child to function in the here and now. Therefore, they, when you travel with them, often they will nag you, when do we get there? They cannot project forward, they cannot project backward. So when I was in Auschwitz, I thought that the whole world was a big concentration camp, that everybody lived without parents or family, in miserable conditions, starving to death, guarded by Nazi guard day and night. Until August, end of August, when one day I saw an airplane flying over the camp. It was flying very low. I could see the American flag on one of the wings. That gave me hope that somebody was trying to free us. And hope in Auschwitz was in very short supply. The air raids continued and increased. By November, we had three air raids a day, and all the experiments stopped. We, I could sense in every ounce of my being that that cannot last much longer, that someday soon we would be free. But how that would happen, we didn't know. The air raids continued late into January. Then one morning, we didn't know what date it was. We woke up, and there were no more sounds of war. Miriam and I talked to each other. Could it be possibly that today will be the day that we will be free? Well, there was no one to really talk to. We went outside. At a distance, I could see lots of people they were wrapped in white camouflage raincoat. They were smiling from ear to ear. I didn't know who they were, but that was not important. One thing was important to me, that they didn't look like the Nazis. So we ran up to them. They gave us chocolate, cookies, and hugs. For me to realize that Miriam and I were free and alive that we have triumphed over unbelievable evil, that my little promise to myself that first night in the latrine became a reality. That was an unbelievable experience. I want to thank you all for listening to my lecture. Today's lecture is 111 this year. So what does it mean? It means I talk a lot, right? <laughs> So why do I talk so much? Not because I want to listen to the sound of my own voice, but because I want to share with you what I have learned from my unusual life. I call them life lessons, lessons I learned in my life. Life lesson number one, never ever give up on yourself or on your dreams even though you live in the United States and in wonderful Valparaiso, Indiana, growing up is very hard. And it's very hard even if you have loving parents. But that would be a very good step in the world if every child was born to loving parents. And even if your loving parents are wealthy enough to buy you designer jeans with holes in them, <laughs> It wouldn't have worked for me in Auschwitz. <laughs> and even then, every single one of you want to figure out for yourself, how do you fit into this big, big mixed up world? Will you be able to accomplish what your plans or goals are? Again, if you give up, nothing will happen. But on the other hand, if you keep hammering away at it. You have brilliant mind. As I look at you, every single one of you are geniuses, in my opinion. You will figure out a way that will work. I did not know how to survive Auschwitz. I was 10 years old. There were no survival courses. I tried different things. And here I am. 73, almost 74 years later, very happy to be alive. 
Life lesson number two, prejudice. What is prejudice? It's to judge somebody without really knowing them, prejudge them. Prejudice always hurts the victims, but it also destroys societies that permit it to happen. So again, because we are all, we are, we are all geniuses, we go to all brilliant minds, we, all we have to do is treat each other with respect. I will ask you here, is there anybody in this group who does not want to be treated with respect? Please raise your hand. Nobody ever does. So everybody wants to be respected. And by using our wonderful minds, we can make a difference. We can also make a difference with people who are violent. Even them, I would like to treat with respect and teach them to respect other people and other people's life. Because violence, to enter it with violence is not the way. I think if we could treat them with respect, at least they might take a notice and change their ways. Life lesson number three, forgive your worst enemy it will heal your soul and set you free. If you would have asked me 25 years ago if I was going to forgive the Nazis, I would have told you to find a good psychiatrist. Because <laughs> I would have thought that you were crazy. I was a very good victim. What does it mean to be a good victim? I was angry with the world. I was angry with everybody. And nothing happened to me until Miriam died. I came home, I was a realtor for 34 years. I came home from an open house. There was a message on my entering machine from my brother-in-law telling me, I'm sorry to inform you, but your sister died. I immediately called Israel and told him that I will catch the first flight to Israel but I never buried anybody in my family. I wanted to say goodbye to Miriam, and I wanted to say goodbye to my kidney. She was taken with her. <laughs> but he said, we can't wait for you. The funeral is in 10 hours. There is no way you can make it. Israel is seven hours ahead of United States, and it would have taken me 24 hours to get there, so I was left with a lot of pain, and what I realized, that I would wake up nights suffocating. I could feel how Miriam died. Her lungs were filled with cancer, and she died in her sleep. I was afraid to sleep, and I knew that I had to do something in her memory. Two years later, I opened Kendall's Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Terre Haute, Indiana, and my nightmares stopped. And months after Miriam died, unrelated to her death, I received a telephone call from a professor at, the, at Boston College who asked me to come and lecture. I agreed. And he said to me, when you come to Boston, it would be really, really nice if you could bring with you a Nazi doctor. I looked in one pocket, I looked in another. <laughs> I said to him, where on earth can I find the name of a Nazi doctor? They are not advertising in the telephone book. <laughs> so he said to me, you like to joke? I said, well, I do prefer to joke instead of crying. I have cried enough. He said, well, what I would like you to think about it Maybe you come up with some kind of an idea, and next day I did. I remember that Miriam and I worked on a project, a documentary, that we finished in 1992 about the Mengele twins. And in that documentary, there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz. He was not my doctor, but I figured if he was alive in 92, he might be still alive in 93. I contacted the film company that did the documentary, 
and ask for the doctor's telephone number. We contacted Dr. Munch and invited him to go with me to Boston. Interestingly, he said, no, he was not going to go to Boston, but he was willing to meet with me at his house in Germany, and we set the date for August 20. As time got closer to departure, the more nervous I became. Actually, I could not sleep for three days. We arrived at his house with two camera crews from RTL, two producers, two translators, and two of my friends. Dr. Munch treated me with the utmost respect, kindness, and consideration. But he told me he didn't know anything about our experiments. Mengele always said that it was top secret. But he gave me a good interview. About, it took about two and a half to three hours because all the questions had to be translated from English to German, from German to English. And we were finishing up. The camera was wrapping up. And I hear myself say, Dr. Munch, you were in Auschwitz when I was in Auschwitz. Did you ever walk by the gas chamber? Did you ever go inside it? Do you know how it operated? He said, yes, yes, yes. This is a nightmare that I live with every single day of my life. And he went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. People would be told that they are going to take a shower. The shower room was cleaned, polished, and they even spread some perfume. As people entered the shower room and they packed it, once the shower room was packed, the doors closed hermetically. Dr. Munch was stationed outside and he was looking through a peephole. He said, the gas did not come from the shower heads. Zyklon B, if you Google Zyklon B, you will see it looks like pellets of white gravel. They were packed in canisters and the canisters were opened outside the roof and dropped through openings that they fell to the floor. So it operated like dry ice. The gas was rising from the floor. As people started suffocating, they tried to get climb on one another to get away from the rising gas, forming a little mountain of intermingled bodies. As Dr. Munch looked, when the people on the top of the pile stopped moving, he knew that everybody was dead, and he signed one death certificate. <coughs> no names, just the number of people that were murdered. I told him that I had never heard about that, and in my opinion, that was a top Nazi secret. Nobody knew about it but the Nazis themselves. So the Sonder Commando that worked in the gas chamber did not know what kind of other operations they had. And I believe that once the Nazis realized that they were losing the war, those death certificates were eliminated. <clears throat> because they wanted to have an exact count of how many people they murdered. But I told Dr. Munch I was going to Auschwitz in 1995, and I wanted him to go with me and sign a document about what he told me at the ruins of the gas chambers in Auschwitz. And he said he would love to do it. So I got back home to Terre Haute, Indiana, very excited that I will have that unique document. And it was important to me that it was not signed by a Jewish survivor who saw it, but by a Nazi. I wanted to thank this Nazi doctor for his willingness to document the gas chamber. I knew it was a strange idea to thank a Nazi, so I didn't tell anybody. I was afraid that my friends would talk me out of it, and I didn't want anybody to talk me out of anything. So I was on my own for the next 10 months. When I was cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, or driving the car, 
I would brainstorm by myself every day, asking myself, what can I give Dr. Munch? How can I say Dr. Munch? Lots of ideas popped into my head. None seemed appropriate until 10 months later. Simple idea, how about a letter of forgiveness from me to Dr. Munch? I knew immediately that he would find it a meaningful gift. But I, what I discovered for myself was life-changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one could give it to me, no one could take it away. And all of you here have that same power. So I began writing my letter of forgiveness. My diction in English is good. My spelling is not. <laughs> so as I finished my letter after four months, I contacted my English professor, former English professor, to meet with me and correct my spelling. We met three times. The third time she said to me, Eva, that's very nice that you forgive Dr. Munch, but your problem is not with Dr. Munch. Your problem is with Dr. Mengele. I started debating the topic. I was not ready to forgive Dr. Mangler. So she told me, when you go home tonight, she said, do me a favor. Pretend that Mangler is standing in your living room, and you go up to him and tell him that you forgive him. Because I want you to have the experience of how that would make you feel. It was a crazy idea. But it sounded interesting. When I got home, I picked up a dictionary and made a list of 20 words relating to the experiments, which then I proceeded to read clear and loud to the make-believe mangler in the living room. Then I finished. I said, in spite of all that, I forgive you. Made me feel unbelievably good that I even had the power to forgive the angel of death. And there was no, nothing that Mengele could do to ever change it. And if I forgave Mengele, I might as well forgive everybody who has hurt me. So that is the way I arrived in Auschwitz with my son Alex and daughter Rina. Dr. Munch came with his son, his daughter, and granddaughter. He signed the certification of the gas chamber. I read my declaration of amnesty, signed it, and I immediately felt that all the pain I carried around for 50 years was lifted from my shoulder, that I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, nor was I a prisoner of my tragic past. I want to tell you two things that I do or maybe three. One is that I have an app, so if you want to find information, you put in your telephone, Eva Core, one word, capital E, capital K. Second, that I tweet a lot, and you can follow me, at Eva Moses Core with a Z. So I tweeted about forgiveness, and I will give you two samples. One. Forgiveness is the best revenge. From the moment a victim forgives the perpetrator, the perpetrator no longer has any power or influence over the victim. Forgiveness is an act of self-healing, self-liberation, and self-empowerment. It's free. I really like that. Everybody can afford it. It has no side effect. It works, but if you don't like the way you feel as a free person, you can always go and take your pain back. No one will stop you. <laughs> I doubt it that anybody who has tried forgiveness would ever go back and become a victim again. So these are life lesson number three. Life lesson number four. I, every morning I get up, I don't know what you do, but I say, hmm, I'm still alive. And that's kind of nice. <laughs> Particularly that I have heart trouble. 
And then I say to myself, what can I do, something good today that will make the world better? Doesn't matter how small or how big, but that is interesting. Who controls our thoughts that go to our mind? We control it. We don't control much else in the world, but we control what we put in our minds. And from the moment I think about what to do to make the world a little bit better, I am dealing with positive thoughts. So, life lesson number four. I want you to think of something good that you can do, one even small thing that can make the world better. Because every single one of you is capable of doing that. And now, before I leave you, I want you to remember, if you want to forgive, if you, any of you, is suffering from old victimhood and would like to get rid of it, all you will need is a piece of paper and a pen. Write a letter to the person or people who hurt you. On the bottom of that letter, you must say and mean the word, I forgive you. Once you succeed in that writing, if it works for you, pass it on to other people, because I need everybody's help to sow those seeds of peace throughout the world. Congratulations, you survived my lecture. <laughs>
Uh, we'll have question and answer right now. So we have two microphones. And please speak clear and loud, announcing, so I would understand you, because the microphone muzzles the, the voices. Really, they are not that clear. We have two microphones here you can line up, but if you like, we'll have two mics also where we will rove and try to get to you in person, okay? So just raise your hand if you're in, um, not coming to the mic. Yes, please. Thank you very much for bringing your message of peace to us. One of the things you said uh, was about forgiveness and to write the letter to whom uh, caused you so much pain and at the bottom, to mean it, to forgive them and to mean it. What and don't mail it. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to tell you, if not for the perpetrator, it's for you. What was your process? How do you come to the point where you can mean it? Well, it's very simple. I ask any of you, ask yourself, are you tired of hurting? Are you tired of feeling angry? And if you are tired of feeling angry, what can you do about it? And I could tell you, if you can just start that letter writing and see how it will get you through, you can try, it's free, it, it will not bite you, it will not do anything negative. But you are the only one who can heal yourself. Nobody can do it. Psychiatrists, psychologists cannot do it for you. You have to do the work yourself. That is the only problem. But you have the choice. The next uh, slide, please. Ms. Kaur, my name is Eric Kispert, and I was in eighth grade in 1998 when you came to speak at my middle school. So I want to thank you for that. I feel very fortunate to have seen you speak not once but twice. Uh, so thank, thank you so much for coming back. Um, my question is, and, and you may not have much insight into this, but do you know what the process uh, of grieving and forgiveness was like for your twin sister, Miriam? Um, the grieving process for losing my sister, I really should thank Dr. John Michalczyk from Boston College, who, who told me to bring a Nazi doctor there. And so instead of feeling so angry and so desperate, I was trying to get ready for my meeting with a Nazi doctor. And uh, my grieving process was very short because I was busy of meeting that Nazi doctor. And once I met him, I tried to figure out a way to thank him for willing to duck it. it was, the whole occurrence was very unusual. Uh, I think that people grieve differently. And when you lose a loved one, it's always painful. But I tell people, you can always do something in the memory of the one, the loved one you lost. That accomplishes two things. Not everybody wants to open a museum or an institution, but you can do as simple an act as maybe visit sick children or visit an older person in the nursing home that doesn't have visitors, and you dedicate it to the memory of the loved one you lost. You can, you can do small things that would help you grieve, but also will keep the memory of your loved one alive. So that's what I would suggest. Try to find something that you can do that would be appropriate to remember your loved one, and it will tremendously help you to feel good. Number one, that you lost your loved one and he did or she did not die in pain. So you do something in their memory. Thank you. Next, please. I'm curious, have you ever come in contact with a Holocaust denier? And if you haven't, what would you say to that person? Well, that was the reason I wanted that documentation of the gas chamber signed by Dr. Munch, I would shove that document in their face. <laughs> Next 
next on this side, please. I cannot hear you, so you will have to raise your voice and enunciate, please. My apologies. Uh, in a society where we find a rise in nationalism and negativity towards uh, refugees, what are your thoughts on the people who want to... I do not get involved in politics <laughs> at all. Next, on this side. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, while you were with the other twins, um, amongst the twins, or even amongst um, Mangala's staff, were there small kindnesses that happened that, that gave you that hope to... Um, there were very, yeah, were there very, first of all, I want to realize that there were different situations. The girl twins were kept separate from the boys. The condition of the girl twins was terrible. Nobody cared about us, nobody cared if we lived or died, we didn't get very poor food, and food and survival was on the mind of every single one of the girls. With the boy twins, there was a older twin, his name was Svi Spiegel, which I learned about only after the war. And he was 32 years old. He had a twin sister. He went to Mangala and said, you want these little ones to be good subjects for you? They, are, they get terrible food, they are in terrible condition. Let me take care of them, but I demand much better food much better conditions. He taught the boy twins each other's name, so they knew each other's names. By in our barrack, we didn't know each other's names. We were only living to try to find a little more bread and to survive. So the boy twins, the also Swiss people, taught the kids arithmetic and geography in their bunk beds and each other's names and promised them that if they survive the camp, he will take every single one of them home. And he did. He also made a soccer ball, and he went outside kicking the ball around to keep up their spirits. The boy twins survived in much better mental and physical conditions than the girl twins. In our barrack, nobody talked to anybody. When you are starving to death, I never went up to another twin and said, oh, my name is Eva Moses, what is yours? It never happened. Children who fight to survive do not reach out to anybody. Survival is the only thing in a child's mind. And survival took up every ounce of my being, on how to live one more day. And it's a very serious job very serious thoughts. There is no room for anything else. So these were the, so be, if anybody was kind to me, I can tell you only about maybe two things. When I was in the hospital, and after the two weeks when my fever went down, I was still not getting any food. A supervisor, I never saw her face. She came in every evening after the, it was dark and she placed a piece of bread on my bed. Would she have been caught? She could have been killed, hanged for that reason. So yes, she risked a lot. And one day she even gave me a piece of her chocolate cake from her birthday. And she told me that was my birthday today and I wanted to share it with you. That was the one act of kindness, but there was another one that I think I would call it an act of kindness. A few years ago, a Hungarian lady wrote to me, you say that you boiled the potatoes at night when the supervisors went asleep. That was true when we organized, organizing kept language meant stealing from the Nazis. We organized potatoes, we boiled it at night. She said, well, do you know that potatoes, boiled potatoes have a smell? 
Well, I didn't know, so I boiled potatoes that night. They sure do. <laughs> so we were 15 to 20 kids who were had potatoes to boil at night. I think the supervisors knew very well what we were doing. Never ever in four months or five months that we were doing that did they ever catch us. We thought we were so smart and we have guards everywhere guarding the barrack and we were supposed to knock on the brick bench if anybody came out from the supervisor's room. They never came out. So my conclusion is that they respected our ingenuity and chutzpah or guts of trying to organize or steal some food for ourselves. Therefore, they never caught us. Anything else? On this side, please. Hi, I'd first like to say thank you for sharing your story as well as your aspect on forgiveness. And um, in your talking about forgiveness and saying that you do it, you find something to do in memory of like loss of a loved one. When you did your act of forgiveness, did you see yourself as doing that for you or like you and your sister as well? No, the forgiveness is not in the memory of anybody. The forgiveness is very simple. If you are tired of being a victim and of hurting, you have to try to forgive because, see, you cannot erase whatever happened and tragic things happen. You cannot change them, you cannot erase them, you cannot edit it out, and you cannot forget them. They are important enough, they affected your life. And all the rules and laws from Washington and from your state and from legislatures, they do not always help you. In my case, I was called a foreigner. I wanted to list the house of an old gentleman and he slammed the door in my face. He has the right to deal with whomever he wants. He didn't violate any law. But I was definitely treated with hatred and prejudice. Where do I go for help? I had to figure out a way for myself, and I did. I think that we have to be smarter at times than the perpetrators, and we are smarter. It takes a little bit more effort, but we can defeat them with our good actions. And they will come. I mean, I was hated in Terre Haute, and anybody who will see my new film, which is called Eva, and you can find it if you Google at, at the story of Eva.com, it's one word, the story of Eva.com, you can get the trailer. And in that, I was tremendously harassed for 11 years in Terre Haute, Indiana, because I didn't like Halloween. I still don't like Halloween. In my opinion, the tricks should be removed from that little holiday, let the kids have fun with their costume. It should be not say trick and treat, treat and treat. <laughs> Why not? We can change whatever we want. The trick I don't like. And it gave me nightmares because it sent me back emotionally to the year before we were taken away. We were harassed and for hours on end, and there was nothing I could do. And then I live in the United States, and the same thing happened to me, so I went outside and chased the kids away. I became very popular. <laughs> yeah. This side, over here. Hello, my name is Asher Yates. Um, I was a combat photographer in Korea, and during my um, Time there, I also took pictures on my own of the people there. However, when I got to Korea, I found out something that was very hard to, to understand. It wasn't so much the, the combat that I went through and watched the GIs and Chinese duke it out. It was the, the people that uh, were displaced. And there was nothing I could do about it or any of my compatriots could do about their starving and suffering. That, that, that is correct, and we are not, you are right, we are not talking about what's happening in North Korea. 
and it's been now going on for probably 60 years, 70 years, I don't know. And the world has not done anything. Then I tweet, I always mention North Korea. People who yearn to be free, so we should tweet. Let's say who is this group is going to tweet or send out something in the internet, it's interesting. If you have enough people doing that, the authorities might take notice. That let's tweet. And what can this guy who is running North Korea, the dictator with a baby face, I don't want to know his name. <laughs> he's no baby and he's no, no good man, person anyway. But we can tweet that he should be removed from power because everybody in this world deserves to live free. And we can, we, it wouldn't hurt anybody because they can't follow you up on tweet. So what can they, they tweet you back, back a thing? I would like them to try to do that. But tweeting is very interesting, is very impersonal, yet I, can, I have tweeted for the people of Iran and I received answers from the Iranian people that they didn't know that anybody even saw their protests. So I think I will tweet a few things I will start tomorrow, tweeting for North Korean people that they are suffering in unbelievably terrible conditions, living for years. I was in Auschwitz for 255 days. They have been in that regime for years and years and years without any freedom, without any hope for freedom. So maybe we should start that little project with the international community here, right, way. We can do that as a good activity to make the world better. See, there are a lot of places, so I thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you, Rebecca. First, I just wanted to, to thank you. Um, my sister and I, uh, we found out recently that our great-great-grandfather was also in Auschwitz. So listening to your story, you've given us a piece of our history in a, in a sense because it was hidden from us and it was not much talked about. So thank you for that. Um, my question is, did you ever find out what happened to your parents or your older sisters? No. No, what the fact is that the Hungarian Jews were the last big transport taken to Auschwitz. The Nazis wanted to be very efficient. They moved the selection platform that used to be half a mile before the entrance and they moved it inside to make it efficient. So it was the first transport that used it. It was our transport. I remember very smooth new cement. And the Hung according to the Auschwitz Museum, from the time the Hungarian Jews arrived, the chimneys burned day and night in 56 days. They murdered almost half a million Hungarian Jews. Only 10% of the Hungarian Jews that arrived there survived because they no longer needed any workforce. The Nazis knew that they were losing the war, but they still wanted to kill as many Jews as they could. Yes. Thank you also, um, Pete. Thank you for your words and for sharing your story with us. Um, you said you don't discuss politics, and I won't ask you to. Uh, my question is just why do you feel that it's important not to discuss them? Because if I say I support one side or lean to one side, somebody else will get angry with me. Number one, we are a nonprofit organization, and as a nonprofit organization, candles cannot be partisan for anybody. So that is even against our rules. Uh, and the staff always watch us out not to express their own opinion. I do have an opinion, and I am entitled to keep it private. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, 
I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Can you speak up a little bit? Could somebody help her? <laughs> somebody who knows how to speak into the microphone, or can you just Hi. tell me what's going on? Hi, um, Abigail Littlefield, and uh, thank you for coming to share your story at Ashwood. Um, I wanted to ask something about uh, your experience in Ashwood. Um, was there any secret language um, that like the Nazis or official soldiers are communicating with at all? Did you understand any of it at all? When does she think? <laughs> Was there any secret language that was used in Auschwitz? No, the only secret language was used organizing. That meant stealing from the Nazis, but all of it wasn't secret. That was called, we never called it, even today I wouldn't call it stealing because I don't feel it was stealing. I was uh, starving to death. They were making me starve to death. I was entitled to some food, so, but it was called organizing, and everybody called it organizing. So I don't think it was a secret language. Either, first of all, there was not much talking. People who start to death do not talk that much. They think of ways to try to survive. And talking was not one of them. Thank you. Okay. One more question. Okay. One more question from the right side here. Um, uh, hello, uh, Ms. Korg. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm thankful that you were able to come up here tonight. Uh, I watched your documentary when I was about eight, nine years old. And ever, that really gave, um, let me understand what the Holocaust was, was and I remember um, just um, sobbing after that. And from that, you became one of my personal heroes. And I just wanted to let you know that. But I have a question about what was your feeling when you realized that you were going to be able to go to Israel? What was your feeling about What that? was my feeling when I was going to Israel? Yes. I will tell you, it's a very important question, actually. See, people don't realize that Jews who have never lived in Israel and never been persecuted, but if they were persecuted as Jews, could not feel you have to like who you are. And I could not change the fact that I was Jewish. The fact that I was treated and almost murdered for being Jewish was a very, very negative experience. Living in Israel permitted me to enjoy the fact that I was Jewing, Jewish, and I, I liked the fact that who I was. And you have to like who you are. You cannot really change who you are. So anytime you don't like what's happening to you, you should really try to like who you are. And that was a very important experience for me. Thank you. Thank you all.